and partner for Alama Ventures Blockchain Fund. Uh, we're one of the co-hosts with uh, Draper Universities and Babylon, uh, one of our portfolio companies, so it's great to welcome everyone to be here. Um, maybe a quick introduction about Alumni Ventures Blockchain Fund. So uh, Alumni Ventures is a network powered VC. We have uh, six, six offices across the US, uh, over a billion under management, a thousand portfolio companies, um, essentially have 600,000 community members from more than 20 US universities. Um, from both, if you look at the, the coverage from Stanford to MIT, uh, Harvard, Yale, Chicago, uh, UC Berkeley, UCLA. So essentially all the university alumni network across the US to support entrepreneurs. Um, so it's, it's wonderful to be part of this program. So for our uh, blockchain fund, we do everything related to blockchain ecosystem from uh, layer zero to layer two to uh, FTs, metaverse. So if you have uh, interesting startups, uh, we definitely want to talk to you. Um, obviously, we're um, a fund that also very much powered by the retail investor as well. So if you're interested in our fund as well, so we'll be happy to, to have a discussion. Um, this is a great pleasure. I mean, really thankful to uh, Draper University to host this. And uh, let me pass the mic uh, to uh, to Saffron and uh, let him be the, the, the true MC for this. I, I just want to give a quick welcome to everyone. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon, everyone. You met me five minutes ago shouting at you guys. That's not usually me, but we had to kick off the event, right? Okay, so uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, during SF Tech Week, I know this is a bit out of the way, but I promise it'll be worth it. Um, so I'm Sofyan, I am the head of programs at Draper University, the building, the hotel you see across the street. Um, this is Hero City, this is our co-working space, our venture funds are also headquartered here. We have, uh, we invest all the way from pre-seed to series A, our pre-seed fund is different, our series A fund is different, uh, but all of them have one thing in common, Tim Draper's name. So <laughs> all, all of those funds have a Draper name. Um, we primarily run programs for pre-seed founders at Draper University. We are sector agnostic. Uh, we also work with a lot of layer one blockchains to run fellowships and accelerators. Um, and our, most of our programs and our flagship programs are non-dilutive. So we run accelerators and take no equity, basically. Um, that's a bit about Draper U. Uh, if you're building in the space, you're pre-seed, seed, uh, I would love to speak to you. Um, I wanted to thank our partners, uh, Sophia and Ray at Alumni Ventures. Thank you so much for putting this together. Uh, this is the second event we're doing with them and the turnout has been amazing. Um, and to Trudy and the Babylon team and the Juno team for just organizing all of this. Big shout out to Trudy, uh, who was coordinating literally everything for this event. Um, thank you so much, Trudy. I don't think she's here because she's checking in people. <laughs> but Trudy, thank you so much. Um, so first up, we have, oh, it is? Oh, is this being, oh yeah, this is being recorded. Oh, this is recorded, okay, yeah. Um, so first up, we have Sunny Agarwal, co-founder of Osmosis, um, who will come speak about mesh security. Sunny? I thought you were having donuts outside. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, nice to meet you. My name is Sunny from Osmosis. I will be giving a talk on mesh security. It is exactly the same one as I gave at Cosmoverse. So sorry if you've already seen it. It is. I, I literally just sent the same exact link. So, but you know, I think now it's a little bit more well flushed out, so I can go a little bit faster, and uh, you know, we'll talk. We're going to talk a lot more about it on the panels. But uh, mesh security. What is mesh security? 
Uh, before we talk about mesh security, we'll, we'll talk about the, you know, network topologies. And so, you know, this is a version of a meme I saw on Twitter uh, many years ago. Uh, and it kind of like puts like network topologies on the political compass uh, meme. And I don't know, it also kind of like stuck out to me a lot. It kind of shaped a lot of the way I think about things. And so, you know, we're trying to design like, okay, how do we want to design networks for systems? And, you know, uh, when we, and when we're like designing the internet of blockchains, you know, an often thing to look to for inspiration is the internet, right? The, you know, and so this is a quote from David Clark, who was one of the, uh, he, his official title was actually chief architect of the internet, which is a dope title to have. Um, and so he had this quote, we reject kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. Because he knew that like to build things at the scale that the internet was designed to grow to, you need to have these like very decentralized uh, systems. And so you know, if we reject kings and presidents, that means we kind of have to reject these hierarchical models. We have to build more swarm-like, ground-up mesh systems. And that leaves us with building architectures either in the green view of the world or the yellow view of the world. The main difference is that the green is this like sort of fully connected graph and yellow is this more sort of organic uh, connection, something there's like power laws and the amount of connections that exist. So these green consensus systems are actually really powerful. Um, and you know, they work on these things called consensus protocols, right? And we have different types of consensus protocols that exist today. We have, you know, BFT consensus protocols like Tenderman consensus, or you have democracy, which is like a sort of green social consensus protocol. Everyone gets one vote. But the problem with these systems are they're very expensive. They have this like sort of N squared overhead, whether it's running on the BFT system, you know, all Tendermint nodes have to talk to every other Tendermint node, or whether you're doing like democracy, and you know, by democracy we mean like true democracy, where, and you know, it worked, this is from uh, Oppenzollern, which is a canton in Switzerland where they do literal open air democracy four times a year, they show up and they like raise their hands, and they solve that N squared communication problem using a synchronous communication mechanism, which is, you know, line of sight. Uh, you can actually literally count and see how many people are raising their hands. And so this works at small scales of cantons the size of Appenzollern. But to make systems work at larger scales, you need, uh, you know, something else. And so in Cosmos, we, we knew this and we said, okay, we're going to build these green systems called blockchains, these consensus protocols, but build mechanisms for them to talk to each other uh, and sort of communicate with each other so we can build larger meta systems on top of that. And so this communication protocol we built is called IBC. And now we have this question of like, okay, well, we have this IBC protocol and these green blockchains what is the meta topology of the network going to look like? Is it going to be this very hub and spoke system that's like, you know, I think that kind of defeats the point of what we're doing with Cosmos, right? Cosmos was meant to be this like extremely neutral protocol with no single chain or single token at the center. It's supposed to be a ground up design similar to the internet itself. Um, you, you know, we have options of like, hey, can we run this like sort of recursive tendermint idea. And so actually, um, you know, Sriram and a couple other people actually had an interesting uh, paper a couple like released last week about like analyzing security properties of recursive tendermint. So that's actually a really th interesting thing to look into. But what we, what, what we are, are what we believe in is this idea of that like, hey, we also are rejecting voting, right? Because even these like green meta consensus systems are not going to scale to the level we want. We have to use rough consensus and rough consensus really is this like yellow, uh, rough consensus is really is this like yellow system that we have to use. So, you know, we have this architecture for a view of how these things should work. And what's really cool is this is actually literally what we've already built in Cosmos is this like very yellow style communication graph where, you know, there's, chains connect to the chains that they want to connect to. There's like, you know, over 60 Cosmos IBC enabled chains right now. And some chains, there's a power law on how much IBC traffic and connections they all have. Now, the question is, how does this, you know, this is about IBC communication. How does this relate 
to security? How, what is the yellow version of security? So, you know, to look at that, let's look at like what are real world security meshes. So what I mean by that is you look at something like NATO. NATO, what it is, it's an alliance of many countries that have a joint econo uh, security pact with each other, right? The Article 5 of the NATO treaty says that any one, if, if any one of the NATO countries is attacked, they all rush to each other's defense. Um, Fun fact, it's only if they're ever attacked in North America or the North Atlantic. So if you're in Hawaii and anyone ever attacks Hawaii, technically the NATO treaty doesn't come into play. Um, that's also why actually the NATO treaty didn't come into play during the Falkland invasion by Argentina. Um, anyway, sorry, that was a side point. Uh, you get a, see, if you get the side, you know, a Cosmoverse, you didn't get those nice little fun facts. Here you get the extra details. Um, the, so, but what's interesting is you look at the, uh, NATO, you see like, hey, there's actually extreme overlap in NATO. Well, actually, I'll get back to that. So yeah, we have this like mesh of security alliances that basically protect the world today and keep it a relatively very safe place in like, you know, a grand historical scale. And so how does this look in the blockchain world? So, you know, let's, we can step through like the evolution of interchain security as a model in Cosmos. So we have the interchain security V1. Uh, well, this is actually a model that we'll use for describing things. So we have, you know, this circle in the middle. This is a validator set. These hexagons, these are blockchains. And the arrow or whatever shining ball of light thing, that means that that validator set validates that blockchain. So in a world of sovereign blockchains, we basically have, you know, every chain has its own independent validator set that validates themselves. Great, cool. Interchain security V1 what it says is we can take the entire validator set of one chain and have it validate another chain. So in, a, in this example, we have a chain like Neutron, which is a, validated by 100% of the Atom validator set. And this is, you know, gives basically equivalent security to Neutron as the Cosmos Hub blockchain will get. But it also comes with these like um, cons where it's like, you know, it requires governance to approve every new chain that goes through this process. And effectively, it's really sort of more like a block size increase, but like a sharded block size, block size increase. It doesn't increase the scalability of these systems massively because the same validators still have to run all of these chains. So this is when inter interchain security V2 comes, which is another way of saying sharding, where it says, hey, a subset of a larger validator set can validate another chain. And so this is really cool because now you can have like, hey, a subset of all of these chains start validating each other. Um, but, you know, there's still, uh, none of these chains have sovereignty. They still have to rely, they don't have their own staking system. They still have to rely on some uh, external uh, validator set, which is where interchain security V3 comes in. So V3 is where things get really interesting, where it says, hey, the validator set, a chain can have its own sovereign validator set, but that can be augmented by security it gets from another validator set as well. So in this case, the Osmosis chain is being secured by both Osmo stakers, but also this subset of Atom stakers as well. And so you can imagine that, you know, this now, now we're getting something interesting, right? Where this looks more like the Cosmos that we're used to today, where it's like, hey, look, everything has their own validator set, but hey, we can all borrow security from one place. But then the the interesting thing is, wait, why do we have to, well, one, this is still sort of running in this very hub and spoke model of like saying, hey, there has to be one provider that provides security to everyone else. Why, why do we have to do that? So this is where, you know, mesh security or cross staking comes in. You can call it interchain security v4 if you want, where it's saying, hey, why aren't we just taking interchain security v3 and running it bi-directionally? Like, yes, osmosis can be getting security from atom stakers, but... The Cosmos Hub can also be getting security from Osmo stakers. And, you know, both chains are getting security from each other, benefiting both of them. And, you know, what's cool is when you start getting it run bi-directionally, that means you no longer have to be running in this sort of hub and spoke model, but can really rather be in a mesh security. So let's say we add a third chain into the mix here, like Juno. Now, you know, they can all be securing each other in this, like, triarchy uh, me method instead of this hub and spoke. So how does this work? So one thing actually, 
I'm going to skip this part because I think one thing that actually didn't come across very well in the Cosmoverse version of this talk is that people made this assumption that what's happening is uh, you have to, validators have to be running multiple chains. So I'll, I'll walk through it actually, but I'll explain why this, what, what's different here. So this chart actually shows like the percentage overlap in validator sets between all of the Cosmos blockchains. And we can see that some of them have actually like pretty high overlaps, such as, um, you know, let's say Juno and Osmosis, right? 75% of Osmosis validators run validators on Juno. 72% of Juno validators are running validators on Osmosis. So that just this is sort of more of a nice heuristical thing to see like, hey, look, there is actually very high overlap in the validator sets. Um, so I'm going to skip this part. So cross-staking. Cross-staking is this idea that like, hey, why can't, if, a, if someone is running a validator on these two chains, why don't they correlate their identity with each other? And so that way, if they get slashed on any one, if they do something malicious on osmosis, they're going to get slashed on both of the chains. So th this kind of makes it so if they do anything malicious here, uh, you know, there's more economic stake uh, backing any individual chain. So... And, and why would they do this? Is because you can prove this idea of cross-staking to both chains, and they would both like sort of incentivize this behavior in order to provide more security for both systems. So now here's the part that uh, I think got confusing uh, during the Cosmoverse talk, which is the system doesn't actually have valid, require validators to be running on multiple chains. We have to stop treating validators as the fundamental unit, because otherwise what will happen is Validators that run on more chains, they're going to get higher rewards, and that's going to cause delegators to always choose to delegate to the validators with, that are cross-staking. And the problem is that not, you know, some va only very professional validators are going to have the ability to run on all 50, 60 Cosmos blockchains, right? And it's going to, like, make a push towards getting everyone to delegate to those few validators, which is not what we want. So how mesh security actually works is it doesn't actually... We have to stop treating validators as the fundamental unit of staking, but actually start treating delegators and stakers as the fundamental unit, because those are the that's where the economic value is actually coming from. And so, what will happen is a delegator, like in this case Amelia, she will lock her stake in a uh, what we call a, a cross-staking contract, and she'll choose to say like, "Hey, I'm delegating to Figment on the Osmosis chain," but what? Amelia can do is she can delegate to any validator she wants uh, using cross-staking. So she can say, hey, on the Cosmos Hub, I'm using my Osmosis stake to also back Figment in this case. But on Juno, let's say Figment's not running on Juno, she can say, hey, on Juno, I'm using my Osmo stake to back Notional. So the idea is that you can use the same stake to back different validators on each chain. And this, this makes it so there's not this sudden incentive or push that requires all validators to run on every possible chain. As long as you have some validator on each chain that you like and are willing to delegate to, you can cross-stake on these chains. Um, and then, yeah, so if Notional does anything malicious, they get slashed on all of them. Um, and then there's also things we have to do to make sure that, like, large chains can't completely take over small chains. And so how you do this is you make uh, systems that, like, cap the amount of voting power that cross-staking can get. So you can say that, like, hey, look, you know, we're going to start doing cross-staking. Osmosis will start doing cross-staking from the Cosmos Hub. But we want to cap it that, like, hey, for now, we only want the Cosmos Hub to have a maximum of 10% of the voting power. Uh, staking power on osmosis. So what will happen is as more atoms keep getting delegated, cross-staked onto osmosis, uh, it'll reach some cap. But as more atoms get delegated, the amount of staking power it gets is completely capped. And that way, you know, it still is economically incentivized for people to cross-stake their atoms because they're still getting the reward. It's just diluting the amount of reward that each cross-staked atom gets. Um, and so this kind of solves the uh, problem of like these chain takeovers. So um, the economic basis of mesh security. So you know, going back to the NATO example, right? Like, if you look at it, n out of the EU countries, only four EU countries are not part of the NATO alliance, and this is significant because what it shows is that like 
countries that have high levels of economic dependency will also tend to want to create security relationships to protect those uh, you know, economic routes, right? And so you can look at chains like Axlar and Osmosis. So you know, I think about, it's a little bit old, but a little bit over 70% of Axlar TVL is on Osmosis right now. Meanwhile, you know, four out of the top 10 assets on Osmosis are coming from Axlar. It's uh, USDC, wrapped Ether, wrapped Bitcoin, and DAI, right? These are all coming from Axlar. So it would suck for both chains if, you know, either of them got hacked. And so, attacked, you know, right? And so what you want to do is these two chains should actually be uh, sharing security with each other. Uh, so that way, you know, the economic the market cap of Axel plus Osmo is securing both of the chains. Um, or something like Osmosis and Mars, right? Osmosis and Mars are building this like joint cross uh, leveraging project pr product together. These two chains are also going to want to uh, share security with each other. And so, okay, but now we have this like three chains in this system, right? Now we have Axlar, Osmosis, and Juno. Now, you know, we have this alliance going on. Okay, but the market cap of all three together are securing. And as more chains join this like system, we have the economic security securing every individual chain uh, keeps going up. Um, so yeah, so this is sort of what we're building with, uh, working towards with mesh security. Um, this this idea is of how you can like add in superfluid staking into it into an idea called interfluid staking that I'll skip for now because I think I'm going way over. But uh, what's really cool is like you know when I gave this talk uh, at Cosmoverse, it was literally just an idea, uh, and now like within a week, uh, it went from being an idea to a proof of concept, and now it's like actually being built out into a prototype by you know people from a mesh of different development teams, right? Like. Uh, Osmosis, Juno, Confio, DowDow, like there's people from a bunch of different projects that are all contributing to like making this uh, a reality. So really exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Hey everybody. Um, sick. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about Juno, not too much. Mostly I want to talk about mesh security and why we find it so interesting and why we're putting so much effort into working on it because we think it's the future. So a little bit about Juno first. Oh, great. Well, I'm going to have to like do the, this thing. Um, that's fine. Got it. Uh, so we're, we're a DAO of DAOs, like Juno doesn't actually have a company around it. Um, and that's one of the cool things about it. Uh, it's fully community owned and operated, uh, which is pretty unique. Uh, we gave out the largest airdrop ever, I think in the history of Cosmos, which is pretty exciting. And that's why we have a very rabid fan base. They love it. Um, and we're a sovereign L1 in the interchain, but mostly we are seeing ourselves as an incubator for the interchain. Um, there are a ton of projects building on Juno. I'm not going to go through them all, but there's a lot of cool ones. DowDow is the coolest, but you know, check it out. Um, and, and we really see like we or we want Juno to be, and I think it kind of already is. It's the best place to launch a Cosmos project. You can build and iterate your protocol rapidly on Juno. Don't have to you know, start up your own chain and worry about upgrades or getting a validator set. Uh, you can find product market fit with a really engaged community. I believe we're the second most active after Osmosis. Osmosis is so good. <laughs> we love it. Uh, and then you can launch your own sovereign chain. Uh, and we actually have had projects that have uh, kind of followed this pattern. So this is Passage. They're going to be launching their own chain soon. And it's like a 3D NFT marketplace. And they're doing cool stuff with gaming and, and things. And this is their marketplace that's currently running on Juno. And eventually, they're moving to our, their own chain, which gets, I guess, to the mesh security part. Is like, how best do we secure these new chains? And how will it also benefit Juno stakers? Um, I think this is a question that many in the ecosystem will also ask. Like, it's also relevant for Osmosis as Osmosis spins out new De DeFi protocols. Like, how does it re benefit from its children without also like dominating them, making sure that its children are still sovereign? 
So mesh security, that's the answer. This is why we're really, really excited about it. And I just want to talk about that a little bit. So we just, you know, we got the whole spiel from Sunny, so I'm going to skip my very TLDR definition. But uh, yeah, we're, we're cross-staking assets to secure another chain. Uh, so these are some of the benefits that, as I see them, like the high-level takeaways for why mesh security is cool. Uh, it's bi-directional security. Chains can secure each other, you know, and that's great. That really respects people's sovereignty. Um, it's built with delegators as central rather than validators, and that is great for preventing validator centralization, as Sunny was talking about earlier, but it also allows for some other cool things. Uh, chains retain their sovereignty. There's no rent to landlord chains, which is great. Um, a cool thing about being based around delegators versus uh, validators is it can work with non-Cosmos SDK-based chains. That's pretty cool. I think there's also, and I hope we'll talk about this a little bit more in the, in the panel, there's a potential to use other assets, like, you know, for example, like Bitcoin or Ethereum, uh, you know, as also kind of like mesh security protocols in the interchain. And if you think about like the market cap of those assets, there's a lot of potential security there. Um, but I think really the, the cool thing about mesh security that appeals to me is that it, it scales. We don't have to worry about validators having to run a new instance of each child consumer chain. Um, uh, yeah, so mesh security can like scale to some like pretty great levels. Uh, and what I love about it is it's a market-based approach. It's not a centralized planning-based approach like Polkadot or you know, some other alternatives. It's, it's truly market-based, which is, makes me excited. Uh, and because of all those reasons, we're happy to be teaming up with Osmosis to make this a reality, and it's happening. Uh, this is, uh, you can actually go here today and check out the, the prototype. It is not audited. We do not recommend this in production, but hey, you can cro this actually is running on testnet, and we were able to cross-stake and unstake assets across the Juno and Osmosis te testnet. So if you go to cosmosm slash mesh security, you can check out that repo, and if you're interested in contributing, reach out to me afterwards. Um, but what, at a high level, what does this mean for a chain like Juno? Uh, well, the first thing that it means is, yeah, increased economic security. Economic security is only one type of security, but it's still important. Um, and that allows, you know, a Juno network to be secured by the combined weight of not just Juno, but Osmo, Atom, Stars, and potentially someday ETH, BTC, and more. But really, I think mesh security will help us be a better incubator for the interchain. So, you know, here's the same thing I showed earlier, but now we've got this nice, nice little line at the bottom, leverage mesh security to secure your new protocol. And, you know, what's the impact for stakers? Well, imagine cross-staking your Juno or cross-staking your Osmo and getting a lot of tokens from the interchain mesh. Like, how exciting is that? Uh, this is a tweet I was quoting from Sunny. Cross-staking is going to be the future of airdrops. I think the whole meta around airdrops is changing. And here's a really interesting opportunity. Instead of airdropping to another token set, like what if you're giving them incentives to cross-stake and provide economic security to your chain in exchange for those rewards? Um, so these are like really exciting things for, for a chain like Juno and really, I think, the whole rest of the interchain. Um, and it's really great to be unlocking these opp opportunities for protocol developers and people building app chains. And so what if I told you this was just the beginning? <laughs> so, you know, I think we're going to talk about it a bit during um, the panel, hopefully. Uh, but I think mesh security is like the first of many mesh protocols. We can think about things like mesh governance. What does, how does a federation of chains come together and make you know, decisions about certain things or, or pool assets? We can look at things like a namespace. So right now, everyone's creating their own namespace. There's uh, like Juno DNS, and there's like Osmo DNS, and there's Stars DNS, and there's Atom Hub DNS. And it's like, how do we create like a global namespace? Like, you know, that could be a mesh protocol. Uh, some other ones might be like, uh, protocols that like enforce fees and royalties across like 
an interchain alliance of chains. You know, how do you, this has been a big problem for like a lot of NFT marketplaces, for example. How do you enforce your fees and royalties across, you know, across chains? Uh, so mesh protocols could be a way that we might, you know, solve some of these problems. Uh, and certainly there's DeFi opportunities. Um, and one that we didn't talk about is, you know, potentially the data availability or, you know, building chains that are composed of a bunch of other chains. Uh, I'll end my talk here. I don't we need to catch up on time. But I'll leave you with this thought. Like interchain is the new paradigm. It's different from multi-chain. Multi-chain is the bunch there's a bunch of chains, but they're not really composing or talking to one another. In the interchain, it's things like mesh protocols, this wonderful property of composition between all these different chains and the new things you get out of that. Um, and I think people are only starting to like rock this. We're still in the multi-chain world, but we're at the cusp of the interchain world. And I hope you all get excited about mesh protocols as this glimpse into maybe what the next paradigm is going to look like. One where interoperability is key. And then we can all think about how that might change our, our go-to-market strategies or what types of protocols are successful in the future. So uh, that's that. I'll leave it to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, next up, we have David Se, founder of Babylon, to speak about Bitcoin security. Okay. Does this work? I hope so. It was working earlier. Murphy's slow. Oh, oh man. Okay. All right. So I'm David. Um, we're from Babylon. So we were, uh, we've been working on bringing Bitcoin security to the cosmos. Uh, today, my focus will be a little bit broader than that because after hearing Sunny's talk um, on mass security, we got quite excited about the idea and uh, we came up with a sort of a broader concept than Bitcoin security, which we call interchain timestamping. So I thought I would use this occasion to get some feedback from the community about this idea. So the problem that we're trying to solve is this uh, mesh, this interchain mesh. And uh, the question is, how can chains borrow security from each other? So we, talk, we heard cross-staking as one approach. Here I present a different approach and we'll see how these approaches compare, how they complement with each other that we can perhaps discuss at the end. But um, okay, so before we do that, let's first define what it means by economic security. So this word has been mentioned many times in the previous two sessions, two talks. So very simple, we worry about the safety of a blockchain. We don't want double spend. We want to make the cost to attack the chain as high as possible. The minimum cost to attack the chain is the security, economic security, okay? All right, so what does that mean in terms of a chain like Juno? All right, so just an example of an attack. So here's the chain, and now someone's tried to fork off Juno, and this is protected by what? By the fact that if you have the fork of Juno, you have to double sign, and uh, this will lead to slashing. So this is a so-called a slashable Juno fork. And the cost of the slashing penalty is, in this case, the economic security of Juno. Okay? So if all the attacks can be slashed, then this is uh, good because this is protected by the market cap of Juno. Because the S Juno, this, in terms of dollar, is proportional to the market cap. However, what we observed is that, in fact, not all attacks are slashable. Not all attacks are slashable. 
So here's a, another type of attack, which is not slashable. So in this case, the upper chain is the early chain. And at the end of this chain, the stick is unbonded. Stick is unbonded. The unbonded stick is used to build a attack chain, the lower chain, which is happening after the unbonding. So now you can catch them double signing, but it's too late because the unbonding has happened. The stick has left the chain. Okay? So this attack is basically a zero cost attack. So because of this attack vector, then the economic security of the chain is in question. So the problem we are, this is the problem that we started off solving in Babylon. Uh, how to protect a chain against this uh, long range and slash work attack. Okay? So slash work attack is protected by the slashing, and slash work attack is protected by what? Okay? So in Babylon, our proposal is to use Bitcoin. Okay? So how do we use Bitcoin to solve this problem? All right, so here's the Bitcoin chain. All right, it is very secure, so it's going along. And now what we do is we place some headers of this chain onto Bitcoin block, and this is timestamp, okay? So the header basically means that we're timestamping, we're saying that this fork, the upper fork is created at a particular time, and the lower fork is created by at a particular time. All right? Now, because of the unborn, because of the upper chains earlier, it has the earlier timestamp on Bitcoin. Okay? So now a client can tell that the upper chain, upper fork, is earlier than the lower fork. All right? And this is a so called protection against long range attack. So, although this is not slashable, so it's no longer protected by the economic security, it's now protected by Bitcoin. So this is the main point, right? So the timestamp on another chain can give you an ordering that can give you protection when you, your own chain has weak protection. All right. So it's too late, and therefore the, the lower branch is unsuccessful. Okay, so what is the... So the, what we're doing is effectively giving economic cost to this attack by using Bitcoin. So let's understand this a little bit more because when I get to... The relationship match security at this point will reemerge. All right, so is this system attackable? All right, how do we attack the system at this point? Any, any suggestion? Well, to attack the system, you now have to change the ordering of the two timestamps. Well, we can do that by forking off Bitcoin itself. Right? So now we have forked off Bitcoin, and now the timestamp is now earlier. The lower chain has now an earlier timestamp, suddenly. In fact, the upper timestamp disappeared altogether. Okay, but this costs you money. So SBTC is now the economic cost of building this chain. You have to get the hash power, you have to go and try to buy this from somebody, no one's going to sell it to you. Very hard to buy this. Okay? So this is a very high cost. SBTC. All right, so whenever I say S, I mean the economic cost, the security cost. So therefore, what we're doing is we're doing, making this zero cost and slash work attack to the cost of forking off Bitcoin. Okay? So this is the first instance where you see that we are using a, another chain to endow economic security to Juno. Okay? I don't mean that Juno will be attacked. I'm just using it as an example, so sorry about that. But I have to use one example. Don't worry, osmosis will show up later. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. All right. So SBCC is not a cost. It's very high cost. So now we have protected the system against the unslashable attack using Bitcoin timestamping. Now, here's a natural question. Hey, since timestamping works for unslashable attack, hey, why don't we use timestamping to protect against the slash work attack also? Well, you may ask, hey, the, the, uh, the slash work attack already has Juno's market cap protecting it. Why do we have to protect further? Well, you, we can add the Bitcoin market cap to Juno's market cap, then it's even more secure. 
Why not? More secure is better. Security is all about increasing your market cap. OK. All right. So here's the idea. We go back to the short range slash white tag. OK. We are using now the timestamp to discriminate these two chains in case there's an attack. So although the attack caused a slashable penalty, we're saying that it's not enough. We also want to use the timestamp ordering to protect against it. OK? So now, what is the total cost of this attack? All right, what is the attack now? We have to fork off Juno first. That means you just get slashed. And then you have to fork off Bitcoin again. And you have to pay a cost to fork off Bitcoin. So now the cost to attack this whole system is the sum of the two costs. OK? All right? So now you have increased the economic penalty of uh, attacking Juno from SGNO to SBCTC plus Juno. All right, so what's the problem here? So this sounds great, right? By checkpoint on Bitcoin, you can actually give security to Juno or to any Cosmos zone. All right. The problem is Bitcoin is a bit slow. How long does it take for Bitcoin to confirm? So let's look at this picture. Why is the confirmation time of Bitcoin relevant here? Well, actually, what we're doing is we're doing a double confirmation. We're saying, OK, we will confirm a transaction if first the committee of Juno agrees. And then when the timestamp on Bitcoin is also confirmed, say, six block deep or 10 block deep, then we say we have double confirmation. We say, good, we confirm. That's the only way that you can use Bitcoin security and Juno security, right? Because you want to say that if it's confirmed on Bitcoin, then it's very hard to fork off. So by doing double confirmation, you get the sum of the cost. But Bitcoin is slow. So this is probably not very usable for most of the transactions, except some very important ones. So how do we use it in general? Well, instead of timestamping on Bitcoin, you can timestamp, actually, on any chain. So why not timestamp on Osmosis, since we just heard that Juno and Osmosis are very friendly. So why not recruit your friend to defend you? Well, so you timestamp on Osmosis. And what's the advantage here? Again, you do double confirmation. You said, I'll confirm a transaction if I'm confirmed on Juno, and, uh, and I'm confirmed also on Osmosis. OK? So because both chains are pretty fast, so now the confirmation is pretty fast. OK? Now you will get the sum of the economic cost. Why? Because to attack the system now, you have to fork off Juno, and also you have to fork off Juno's friend. That's the sum of the cost. OK, so we can summarize all this in terms of this picture, all right, which is osmosis with its market cap S osmosis is endowing additional security to Juno through time stamping. And you get the sum of S osmosis, osmo, and S Juno. OK, wait a minute, Juno said, osmosis, hey, we're friends. Why should I only get security from one direction? Well, you can do this time stamping symmetrically in reverse as well. Osmosis can also time stamp to Juno. All right, now we have a symmetrical relationship. They're giving security to each other. Very good, they're friends. Now, this is particularly important when you have a relatively new chain, as rug pool. Now, S rug pool does not have a very big market cap yet, at least. It hasn't put the rug yet, OK? It doesn't have a big market cap. But Osmosis are now doing IBC with this rug pool. This is a bit dangerous, right? Because who knows what this rug pool does? This market cap is not very bad. And the point is that IBC 
the security IBC is like kind of minimal of the two ends. But now osmosis is giving security to Rugpull. Now Rugpull is also giving security to osmosis, osmosis but probably not, probably not too important here. But the point is that your partner that you're in economic alliance with is benefiting from your own security. Okay? So that's a very important thing. So that remains only one more question before I leave, which is, hey, how can these zones actually timestamp each other? I drew some pictures, but how do you actually build a system with timestamping? All right, so here's an amazing thing that we found. Amazing thing we found, which is, actually, IBC automatically provides this timestamping. Whoa, what's going on? These guys, whoever these guys are, invented IBC. They're just amazing people, you know? Like, when, it, when you're stuck, you just look at IBC and see if you can find a solution. And there it is. What does IBC do, right? IBC sent packets from the center zone to the receiver zone through relays. But how does the receiver zone figure out what you sent me is correct? It may be some garbage you sent me. Well, to do that, the sender zone headers have to be sent to the receiver zone. And in fact, the receiver zone maintains so-called a light client, which means it keeps track of all the headers to make sure that it keeps track of the validator set, the dynamic validator set of the sender zone. So that it knows that when you have a sent message, as said, okay, good, it's signed by the correct validators. But actually, the sender zone headers, which is now on the ledger of the receiver zone, is exactly the timestamps we need. Okay? So the sender zone is actually sending the headers, and the headers are precisely the timestamp. So IBC already has these timestamps. Wow. Okay? So with Camila, our intern, we discovered this in the summer. I'm sure other people know about it, but it was like a huge discovery for us. Because our business is really time stamping. Okay? All right. So the point is that here's the match that Sunny showed and uh, Jake showed. Actually, the timestamps, okay, are already here to be exploited. And you can use these timestamps to build interchain timestamping. It can be between a pair that we discussed, but it can be extended to, say, triplet. And so this brings me back to what Sonny said, which is security and alliances follow economic alliances. But here we have it in a more concrete instantiation of that, which is economic alliances means what? Means that you have IBC connection. And because IBC provides a timestamp, and, and we show that the timestamp provides security improvement, security alliances therefore follow from economic alliances. Thank you. All right, next up, we have Jehan Trembeck from Interchange Security. We're just figuring it out. Literally 
plug in plug out. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. It's. Oh. All right, God. No, it's on. All right, there we go. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so I want to talk about uh, comparing replicated and mesh security. Uh, and replicated security is kind of the, um, it's probably what we should call interchange security v1, because v1 is a pretty terrible name. Um, oh, there we go, cool. So uh, yeah, so we, uh, I'm on a team at Informal Systems um, building out replicated security, interchange security v1. Um, and for a long time, we, uh, you know, as well, it's actually before I even came on the team, um, you know, people were talking about v2 and v3. Uh, and so V2 was where you'd have the opt-in, like Sonny was saying. Um, we found that was insecure. Uh, I, I can get into why a little bit uh, maybe later. Uh, and then also V3. Uh, we kind of couldn't figure out how to build V3. Um, and so we went to Cosmoverse. We saw Sonny's talk uh, with the delegator, uh, the, the sort of the delegator model versus the validator model. And, and um, we were like, oh, cool, that's, that's, like, that's the way to do it. Um, so that was pretty exciting. Then we spent, um, we, we sort of, on our team at Cosmoverse, we spent, you know, uh, several days like, debating, like, how can we figure out, you know, what the properties of the system are. Um, and so we came back in the past few weeks, we actually built a model. Um, and so we can calculate the security of different, uh, of different interchange security methods. And um, so first I'll say that what, what is security, I think, is an important thing to ask because it's, it's kind of just thrown around. Um, and so the security that interchange security deals with mostly is, um, is economic security. And uh, economic security is basically about, in, in our model, in the way I see it, it's about the cost, to, um, the cost to censor and the cost to control a blockchain. Uh, Double signing is a little bit of a different uh, topic. That's what the last speaker was talking about was, was, was double signing and punishing for double signing. But there are a lot of attacks where you can't slash for those attacks. So for instance, the validator set of a chain with 66% of the validators, they could just like, um, you know, they, they could just basically take over the chain's logic and empty all of the IBC bridges connected to the chain uh, and take all the money away. Uh, and there'd be no way to slash them for that on chain because they would control, you know, the uh, they would control their, their, their own their own slashing mechanism. Uh, and then that's sixty six percent, right? Because you have to have two thirds to approve a block, and that's the block that could be doing the attack. Um, then also with thirty three percent, you can censor it. So you need two thirds to approve a block, and that means that if more than one third of the validators don't want to approve it, uh, then the you know they can stop all blocks from being produced, or they can only allow blocks to be produced that have certain transactions in them. There are attacks related to this too, like if you stop, uh, it's a little more difficult maybe, maybe involving market manipulation or payment channels, you could stop somebody from doing something that they need to do. Um, so uh, yeah, th th basically in this, in, this, uh, in this frame, we're gonna look at the cost to censor and the cost to control. So I'll get into the diagrams here. Um, it looks like my, uh, Slideshow got a little messed up, but it's still pretty readable, I suppose. So this is replicated security, uh, interchange security v1. Uh, so basically, what you have here is you have the Cosmos hub is one validator set, one staking token, and several chains being uh, produced by this. And so uh, these chains have, have their own tokens. They don't have to have their own tokens, but many of them will. So for instance, Neutron, um, they'll have a governance token using, uh, using DowDow. Uh, and they'll also be able to keep the fees. So transaction fees generated on that chain, uh, they can be kept by the chain. And so uh, there can also be a portion that's sent to the, uh, what we call the, so the hub, what we call the, the provider chain and the, the chains that are being uh, secured by it are the 
consumer chains. Uh, fees can also be sent back, but we're thinking the majority will be kept by the consumer chains. And that's also going to be the case with mesh security, uh, I'm guessing, as well, because otherwise probably people wouldn't cross stake if they weren't getting a reward for it. So we're looking right now at maybe 75% of the fees get kept by the consumer chain, 25% get sent back, but it, the proportion could, could differ. We don't really know how the marketplace is going to really play out. Um, so yeah, these chains, they, they keep the fees. Uh, there's different governance methods, so like on Neutron, it's a Cosm Wasm uh, DAO DAO, uh, DAO. Um, and then on Stride, there's actually uh, something we call the um, democracy module, and that's got governators, and the, uh, the, the, the governators are like validators, but they, uh, this was, the, the term was coined by someone who wasn't familiar with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, but um, <laughs> the, the um, the, uh, the, the governators are like validators, like in the Cosmos uh, governance system that you see. Um, they're like, uh, you know, they're like validators. They're kind of representatives, like a liquid democracy system. They just don't run actual validating nodes because that's done by the, uh, the one validator set of, of the provider chain, basically. And for the Cosmos Hub, the Cosmos Hub's only real purpose, actually, um, after, we, after we complete this next upgrade, is kind of only going to be there to keep track of uh, to keep track of the, um, you know, the inter interchange security, the replicated security. So it's pretty much just there to be a validator set. Even new features we're doing. So we're working on something called the scheduler, um, which is kind of a cross-chain MEV auctioning thing. Um, we're getting ramped up on that. We're going to build that as a consumer chain uh, just because it's, it just makes things a lot easier. You're not locked into one release cycle for all the products. It just makes things easier from an engineering perspective. So... Um, even there, the, the, the Cosmos Hub itself will, will just be there to manage that validator set. Um, so then we'll go to mesh security. So with mesh security, again, the, it looks like the boxes that I, I made aren't showing up, but uh, with, with mesh security, there's, um, I think you can probably still read it. You have multiple chains, but they each have their own validator sets. So you see chain C here, chain C is the consumer chain. And chain C has its own validator set. And chain A and B, all that, they, uh, all that they do is they send delegations to chain C. So you have your tokens on chain A, and you can basically say, I'm going to delegate not only to my chain A validator, but also to a validator on chain C. Uh, and that's what you know, Sonny went over in his talk. You probably understand that now. Um, but then, um, it, so, so what you're getting out of this is, is you're, you're purely you're getting the economic security. So, oh, and I forgot to say on my last diagram here, I think Sonny went over this, but it's like basically it costs the same to compromise any of these three chains as it would to compromise the Cosmos Hub itself. So the cost to, uh, to censor and the cost to control are the same as on the Cosmos Hub. In mesh security, um, that's not necessarily the case, uh, but any, any money that's, if I'm staking $100 on chain B and um, I cross stake it to chain C, then uh, it's, it's going to, um, that's also going to, it's, it's going to add a, a $100 basically to the cost to censor and the cost to control of chain C. Uh, and so we wanted to figure out basically like what, like what is, in given configurations, what is the cost to censor and the cost to control? Like if you have a given consumer chain and this set of providers, like what are those numbers actually going to be given the market caps, the staked amounts and stuff? Um, and you also might be asking, well, here in this example, you know, there's not a mesh, they're not all connected together reciprocally and stuff, but for this analysis, you don't actually need to get into the mesh part of it. You can look from the perspective of one consumer chain and its providers. And if chain C happens to also be cross-taking back to chain B, uh, that doesn't affect the math for chain C's uh, cost to sensor and cost to control. Um, so that, then that breaks, you know, makes the analysis a little easier. So, we came up with this model. Uh, actually, my, my colleague, uh, Marius Poke, came up with it. Um, so I hope you guys get it. But it's, it's actually in a blog post that <laughs> we, uh, I actually don't understand it myself. I mean, I probably could if I sat down and read it for a long time. But um, we, we also had someone else, an economist that works in informal, look over and check it as well. So uh, probably is, is correct, I'm hoping. Um, but, but we're going to have it in a blog post. So we're hoping that if there's problems with it, people will come in and um, you know, tell us what's wrong. So we also turned that model into an app, so you can just play with it yourself and try it out. Um, and uh, so this is obviously a slide. I, I, we could probably pull it up on the computer later if we want or something. I can give people the URL. You can get it from our blog post. But basically here you can go and you can put a provider chain in, and uh, you can put in the total amount cross-staked. That's not going to be the market cap. That's going to be 
uh, basically the market cap times like the, the staking percentage. That's just the amount they have staked. Um, and then you have the consumer chain. And so the consumer chain, what you see here is you see the cost to censor and the cost to control. Uh, and so there's some other parameters too. The consumer chain can have its own stake. Here I'm demonstrating replicated security. So with replicated security, they share the same validator set. So the consumer chain doesn't actually have uh, anything staked on the validator set. So it's got zero there. Uh, the Cosmos Hub here, it's got um, about $2.7 billion or $2.8 billion uh, staked. Also in this model, in this app at least, the model has, you know, it's adjustable, but for the, for the app, we actually just made it so it's 100% cross staked just to give the most generous kind of estimate that we can. Um, so we're saying that everyone who staked on the Hub has also chosen a validator on uh, the consumer chain. Or, well, in the case of in the case of replicated security, they didn't need to choose a validator because it's just the validator they're already staked to. But uh, yeah, so there we see the same cost to censor, cost control is the hub. Uh, 931 million to censor, 1.8 billion to control. Uh, so then I wanted to also look at the scenario from Sonny's talk. Um, and this is with the 10% power cap. So, and Sonny, you can also check the model to see the, you know, if the power cap works the way you would imagine because we, we kind of just went off of like the most general way we could, uh, we could think of it. But we're basically saying that we're capping, you probably can't read this well, but we're capping the effective voting power of each of these chains to 10%. And so here we see the uh, consumer, and we all also given the consumer chain a healthy, like respectable, um, you know, self-staked amount of 100 million. Um, and then you have the Cosmos Hub, Evmos, Osmosis, Junos, you know, some, some really respectable chains here um, who are part of this mesh, and uh, they're all capped at 10%. So here we have uh, a cost to sensor of um, you know, 83 million, cost control of 273 million. So the consumer chain by itself would have a cost to sensor of 33 million and a cost to control of 66 million. So this is definitely a pretty respectable security bump. But these provider chains, they're also the 10% power cap is, uh, is kind of greatly reducing the amount of power that they're able to uh, supply, basically. And there's also, I'll just pause here, uh, there's also the question of how one would carry out an economic attack. Um, that is a pretty nuanced question because buying enough of a token on the market to actually do an attack would be very difficult. It would make the price spike. You would have get less for your money. So uh, it wouldn't actually, you know, if you were doing it that way, that wouldn't really probably work. Um, but it's more like, I guess, I guess, you know, people holding the tokens could just decide to do it on their own or whatever, and they already had them or something. So it's kind of pretty hard to actually decide how hard the attack would be. But if you have the numbers, you can at least get, you know, into the ballpark. Um, but then we take off the cap. We're going to take off the cap here for the last example. And uh, we're going to let each of these, we set the cap to 100% for each of these provider chains. Um, and this means that they can now uh, basically put as much, the power, it's kind of, they, they all get balanced against each other and against the consumer. But uh, they're, they're basically allowed to use their full power and it's not capped. So here we have a cost to sensor of uh, 1.2 million, or sorry, 1.2 billion, and a cost control of 2.4 billion. Um, so that's about nine times higher than the previous example with a 10% power cap. So this is the way to get the most economic security: is take cap off. Um, and it's also, if you'll notice, it's actually 25% higher. And I guess I'm not going to have you do the math in your head here, but it's, it is 25% higher than. The hub itself. Um, so you see here, it's you know, it's yeah, it's uh, it, it's more. So it's an improvement. It's it's a 25 with this set of provider chains. There could be a lot more provider chains. Uh, it, it's an improvement over replicated security by itself. Um, so what we're doing with replicated security, there's also you know, there, there's a lot of there are a lot of projects, especially coming from uh, other ecosystems like Ethereum, where they kind of have they're not like they're not really focused. Some projects don't have any desire to run their own consensus layer. Um, and so projects like that, they may stick with replicated security um, even after mesh security is available uh, because they just, you know, they, they, they're, they're, their token is able to accrue value in other ways um, and they just, you know, they, they, they don't necessarily need it. But for projects that want to switch, um, we're actually building code. Uh, well, it's actually the same code that we've already started on, but basically we have code to make a, do a seamless transition from a self-stake chain to a replicated security chain, and also from a replicated security chain to a 
you know, back to a self-stake chain or a mesh security chain. So um, what we're suggesting is that right now, launch an extremely high security chain with replicated security on the Cosmos Hub today, well, in January. And uh, then, you know, when, when mesh security is ready uh, and it's proven out, then you can transition to mesh security seamlessly for a, uh, you know, for a boost in the security. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what we're recommending. There's also kind of questions about, you know, is, <laughs> is mesh security more decentralized? I, I used to work at a, uh, I used to work on mesh networks in the real world on, on, on radio, like internet mesh networks. Um, and decentralized is like a very sort of, um, it's a very vague term, you know? And, and like, even when I was talking about the attacks there, it's, it's very hard to tell like what a possible attack is. Uh, you know, and there's also, it's like, what does, you know, there, there's more maybe than economic security that you want from decentralization. It's not just how hard it is to attack, but there's also, you know, there's other things you might want to get out of it. Like, you want to have a very, you know, let's say a very, uh, this is Sonny's diagram here, a very diverse, um, you know, like a diverse set of different people running a given chain. And so with mesh security, you will have more entities. If you're getting it from several different provider chains, you will have more entities, kind of more people uh, delegating on your chain. So that, that is more decentralized in some ways. Um, but also with this diagram here, you do have a lot of overlap in the validators in different chains. Uh, and then also in, in delegators and token holders of different chains, um, you know, probably also have a lot of overlap too. So um, I think it, it, it increases the diversity and the decentralization somewhat, um, but there's still a lot of overlap as well. Um, and then the Cosmos Hub itself, oh, this, these, uh, yeah, again, it got colors well washed out here, but I did a Twitter poll to find out who the CEO of the Cosmos Hub is, and um, <laughs> the results are pretty uh, evenly evenly spread. I think that Jay Kwan actually, Jay Kwan at one point, I believe, was actually the CEO, but um, he's still like, he kind of edged, you know, edged other people out a little bit, but it's pretty much very evenly spread among, among all these people, including Uncle Ed. And um, so it's like, you know, the Cosmos Hub blockchains are already decentralized. Like, I feel like it's, um, you know, it's like the Cosmos Hub is not like the man I mean, I guess by saying that, maybe I'm reinforcing the Cosmos Hub is the man, but it's like, you know, it's already a decentralized network of validators connected in a mesh, um, providing security for state machines. Um, and it's also like a very, um, kind of like a very vibrant democracy where like what the Cosmos Hub does, there's no like CEO, like a lot of blockchains, like startups, is like a CEO who kind of says, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have a partnership, um, you know, with these guys, we're going to get listed, you know, and it's like, Cosmos Hub, it's not really like that. People come in with, you know, there are core contributors, including myself, who are paid by uh, the ICF, which is a, a Swiss foundation. But it's like, we don't have a huge amount of influence on the Hub's direction. We tried to bring out, or not myself, but people on my team tried to bring out Prop 69 earlier this year to, to bring Cosmos Mod to the Cosmos Hub. And that was, uh, that was defeated. Um, and, you know, recently brought out Atom 2.0, and that was... Um, a lot of controversy around that and they had to go the team working on that had to go back and and change it so it's like and there's also other organizations contributing so i think like the decentralization um i think is it, it's it's a very it's very kind of a hard uh you know hard thing to put your put your finger on but i will say the verdict that i would have though is i think this is my last slide sorry um the verdict that i would have is will mesh security like if you're if you're running a replicated security chain on the cosmos hub Upgrading to mesh security, um, you could see a 25% security boost. Um, sorry. And um, it's also more diversified. So if you, you know, if you have more provider chains, you kind of have to pr trust the provider chains that you use because they do have the ability to attack themselves if they, you know, in theory. Um, but it's more diversity too. So if, let's say the Cosmos Hub goes down the tubes and uh, Kujira becomes the new biggest blockchain, um, then you, um, you know, then, then, then if you're already, like, you didn't have to decide to switch over to replicated security on Kujira, you already, like, without the power cap, it smoothly adjusts, so now you're going to be getting the most security from them. Um, so, so I would, yeah, so, so I think that, will mesh security uh, make replicated security chains more secure? Yes, a little bit. Will it make them more decentralized? I'd also say yes, um, also a little bit, unless things drastically change. So, uh, yeah, thanks.
Thank you, Jaha. Okay, I know we're in need for a break, but we have one more panel and then we take a short break. Um, so next up for the panel, I would like to invite David from Galileo on stage. Oh, there you are. Hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, I think there is going to be a few other people joining us yeah. on the panel. Hi, everyone. I am David Falk. Uh, I am the managing partner at Galileo. We are an early stage VC fund uh, focused on the Cosmos ecosystem. Um, and today we're going to continue our discussion on securing Cosmos. And I'd like to uh, invite up uh, Professor Say, Jehan, Jake, and Sonny to the stage. switched. <laughs> nice. So um, Cosmos was an early pioneer in proof of stake systems. And once again, on the cutting edge of uh, security and blockchain architecture, right? Um, so first, thank you guys for that glimpse into the future. Um, I think, uh, you know, lowering the barriers to entry for blockchains is kind of what we're all here for. Um, I'd like to... <clears throat> Um, I also want to say thank you to Professor Say for, uh, and Babylon for making this happen uh, and also for making Bitcoin cool again, giving it an entirely new use case, uh, novel use case instead of just um, an economic uh, token. So um, a couple things I wanted to go deeper on uh, after hearing your talks uh, first is when we think about mesh security, how can we expand that further to other proof of stake systems and data availability, data availability systems like Ethereum, Celestia, and Eigenlayer? Um, Sonny, maybe you have some thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, the cross-staking system was kind of uh, somewhat inspired by like the restaking system of Eigenlayer. Uh, Honestly, we could have just called it restaking as well. The reason we didn't call it restaking was just because we already have this term in Cosmos called redelegating, and we didn't want it to be confusing with that. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, cross-staking and restaking, basically effectively similar ideas, which is just saying, hey, take existing stake and use it to back, opt into more slashing conditions. So yeah, I mean, I think it'll be really cool to like plug into uh, Eigenlayer as part of the mesh security system and basically use Ethereum as part of, you know, in the mesh security paradigm. I think it's interesting. Um, I could actually, so Eigenlayer is, is a lot like what we were calling Interchain Security V2, which is that you have people who are, you have the validators. So it's not like mesh security where it's just literally the, the delegators taking their money. You have the validators running hardware. They happen to be Ethereum validators as well. And on Ethereum, you can't make them all. With replicated security, the validators have to run the consumer chains. Um, it's just part of what they're doing uh, for, you know. So then for, for, uh, with, with Ethereum, obviously, as a smart contract on Ethereum, you can't actually just like, you know, force the validators to, to, to run whatever you want. And so they can always opt in. And the issue with opt-in uh, opt security is that um, the set of validators that opted in to run your app even if the whole validator set is good, the set of validators who opt in to run your app might be bad. Um, and one very easy example is like if you have some small validators who opted in, uh, to, are running the app fine, whatever, everything's great, and then you have one big validator come in, then they can basically take over essentially the entire control of the app uh, just because that, they have that much more, that much more stake. Um, and so with Eigenlayer, what they, what they are doing, I talked to them about this, they're making sure that um, they're confining their application to be used only for things that are, um, that are basically like on-chain slashable. Um, and so it is a little bit more of a nuanced, it's a more of a nuanced use case, I think, and it's something that's better suited for rollups because rollups you can prove like misbehavior on, you know, in the application logic itself. But that's, that's kind of a tangent, I guess. But. 
One question for like interchain security v2, like the takeover thing. Another thing that I've been th we've been thinking about recently is like using rate limiting to solve this. Where so this is something I actually suggested to Stride as well, which is like Stride is like a liquid staking protocol, and it's like how do we make sure that someone doesn't like take over Stride like governance and then like use it to like shift all the delegation into like one validator. So what they should do is like build like rate limiting where it's like you know at the chain level they can't. Uh, you know, shift delegation faster than a certain speed. And so you could, could you do something similar with like uh, V2 where it's like, hey, a giant validator could show up, but they're rate limited on how fast they can join. Yeah, that, that's, the, yeah that's the solution. Um, I mean, it appears to be the solution. We thought about that, but it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a matter of, I think it's a matter of judgment maybe, um, but rate limiting can always be defeated by, by civil attacks. Uh, and a given Sybil attack to attack such a rate, you could have the big validator could look like a bunch of small validators. In the example of eigenlayer on Ethereum, Ethereum kind of forces big validators to split their money up into a bunch of different nodes. So on Cosmos, it'd be harder because there's a limit on the number of validators, so it'd probably be more noticeable if someone was doing that. Um, but we kind of, uh, I don't know, we, we, uh, we sort of made the judgment call that, you know, we're trying to make systems that are like, really secure under every scenario and so we don't want to make something that's like kind of secure if people do what they're supposed to do and nothing goes wrong and it's mostly probably secure most of the time um we just made the decision not to do that so so we were waiting for something better to come along um and mesh security i think is is probably better to do than, than v2 yeah i guess getting back to the original question um I, you know i think that there is this like i think at some point i know there's a couple teams working on it already like an L2 that on Ethereum that will bridge to IBC, and uh, at that point, you know, if we if we can have like like an L2 that connects to IBC with mesh security, there is what what excites me. There is this potential for being able to use ETH in in the interchain for security, and I would love to see something similar with uh, Bitcoin. I know Sunny knows a lot more about that. Um, I think you could do mesh security with eigenlayers. So people would keep their ETH staked and then participate in mesh security at the same time. Cool. So mesh security makes sense intuitively, right? We can imagine that world. What are the practical limitations of mesh security, if there are any, in a world of thousands of chains? What operational complexities does that add for validators, for users, delegators? Uh, we, we can take those one at a time. I think for, for validators, there's not really any operational complexity. You, with mesh security, one of the great things about it is you don't have to run an additional node. Like, it's again, it's based around delegators rather than validators. Uh, for for delegators, there is, I think for chains is like a, there's another question of like you know, um, which chains do you want to connect to in the alliance? Who do you want to consume people? like security from like is it a completely free market or is it like governance gated you know these are some of the open questions uh for delegators there is additional kind of ux overhead again this is maybe an, a layer that could be solved like la later down in the stack or with like additional you know like design and ui but you you do have this overhead of like you have to as a delegator you have to choose you know who you're delegating to on each of these chains and so with thousands of chains like that's a lot of chance to keep track of validators for. Uh, so you could imagine like a very powerful staking tool, but you know, I think by the time we get to that point, we'll have like, you know, kind of like smart contract based like delegations that will like manage like sort of delegation strategies across all those different chains, but that it is a real problem in scaling that will happen for the de from the delegators perspective is like, how do I choose a validator on all these like 20 different chains or whatever? Yeah, like there's, there's, it's weird. There's actually like weird UX like trade off between like making the UX easier versus like driving towards centralization. Because we could allow validators to correlate their identities across chains and have it so you automatically cross stake to validators on multiple chains. But then that might lead to more centralization. So there is like a balancing that we have to do there. It could also lead to an attack that's like the subset problem with V2, where if you had one validator on, let's say, a small consumer chain, or, you know, as I guess it's not designated only as a consumer chain, mesh security, but a small chain has one validator, and then they have provider chains from several other chains, uh, and those chains could all be power capped too. Um, but if they only have one validator, just in this example, uh, one validator in common with all those provider chains, you could have a situation where that one validator is like representing the 10% of like these, you know, 
five other, you know, much bigger chains. Um, and, and that would happen only, though, if, if the delegators of the bigger chains also kind of automatically just jumped onto, like, the, you know, that validator if they're part of it. So you do want to have some kind of, like, I guess, again, rate limiting. Um, and making people choose it themselves does also kind of rate limit it in, an, in a natural way. In a world where um, security is both multi-dimensional or can be dual in the case of mesh security and Babylon, how do we think about pricing security? I don't know if anyone has a really great answer for that yet, to be honest. I, I will, from my experience, um, I, 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 was, uh, I, I used to work on a, a mesh network startup and we were kind of like, at one point, um, we were in like 2018 or 19, we were having a, a hard time kind of figuring out what does our token do. Um, and then we're like, hey, we'll build a Cosmos chain uh, and then it's gonna be a staking token. <laughs> um, so it is kind of, there, there is this ability right now for there to be somewhat of a cop out and, and you know, this whole space is so speculative so who knows if it will you know, play out, but like it's a kind of a cop out where you can say, okay, what is a staking token? Um, but I think that with lots of these, these interchain security and sort of these, these more flexible security approaches, um, it's probably good if you're doing tokenomic design to make sure your token does something else than just be a staking token because uh, you can get security from anywhere. So if you have a small chain, you got a you know, $10 million market cap and you're there with your $3 million and $6 million cost to sensor and control, you'd be stupid if you're not using mesh security once mesh security's out. Um, but then also, you're going to have your chain's going to have to pay rewards to the people providing the real security from the other chains. If they're all much bigger, um, that's probably going to be be most of it. So your token needs to have a way to accrue value as a governance token or as something else uh, representing the chain, and it can then be used for security. But I don't think that just using it for staking as a way to accrue value is going to last that long. Yeah, it's it's too early to tell how this will all play out. I think one thing that we might see is this emergence of like these kind of mesh governance systems or like interchain alliances where you know maybe maybe uh, chains don't want to pay out rewards to each other but they're like closely closely re related in, in mission enough that they decide to you know create an ep economic pack where they're not paying out rewards to the other chains but they're still like engaging in like a mesh security that's much more kind of governance focused it's like we're going to team up like there's not going to be extra rewards or maybe they'll you know even like there's many different ways to structure this. And I think that's, you know, it's still really early in mesh security and that there's like a lot more experimentation and thought and, and probably will be evolution. Like, I, I think we will like ship something and, but there's a whole class of mesh protocols that are just like really, really exciting. Um, it's the capitalist mesh security versus the communist mesh security. Yeah, the capital, <laughs> but like that's just a kidding. real, you know, but there's always, there's like a whole spectrum there of like potential designs for these kinds of systems. Um, and, you know, I think, for some chains, that 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 economic relationship uh, is fine. You know, if like uh, if a chain like the Cosmos Hub is like, you know, incubating and like the the treasury or, or a chain like Juno, those treasury is being used to like fund development of these protocols. You know, kind of expect those protocols to be like paying back into the thing that funded them. Like, um, so it'll be really exciting to see how this all develops. Yeah. So we actually thought about this problem in a specific context. So one use of Babylon, for example, with the unbonding attack was the fast unbonding. So what is the economic value of fast unbonding? So that would translate into a security benefit. So that uh, turns out to be a problem of option pricing. So perhaps there could be some connection there. For the curious out there and the builders, because that's why we're all here is uh, building you know, a better future, what needs to be built for mesh security to be real? Yeah, so I could, I could take that. Uh, so we actually already have a re repo that we're working on, uh, Osmosis, Confio, and Juno primarily. Uh, and if anyone's interested in contributing to it, please like reach out to me after the talk or DM me on Twitter. My DMs are open. Uh, we're not just building the smart contracts, uh, though those are well underway. We're also trying to build a really good user experience on top of this, because that's gonna really help people understand what's happening and communicate this idea of restaking or this idea of cross-staking. And so we're actually trying working with some designers and trying to like create like good visuals around this stuff so that a non-technical person can just look at it and they 
can sort of understand what's going on. Oh, I'm, I have my Juno staked on Juno, but I'm also going to cross stake it on osmosis and get additional rewards from that. Like it's, um, I think in many ways this UX experience is very much like many staking UIs, but um, there is the added complication of like, it has to be done across all these chains and then how do you create a UI again that will scale for probably like, let's go for like five chains initially and then we can work on the next version. But um, we're definitely looking for open contributors, so. So in addition to building software, I have a question. So in typical, um, when we do, when we generate new consensus protocol, we do security analysis, which shows that all attack vectors are, can, are protected. Is there any room for security analysis for these cross-stacking protocols? Oh, absolutely. And also kudos to Informal for like, you know, starting, starting to look at this stuff. It's, it's really, really important and super valuable. And we're really glad to like, have you guys be a part of the mesh security journey, journey even though I'm like, not sure about that math, but you know. Um, well, you can, uh, that was impressive, but <laughs> that was impressive. <laughs> but no, it's there is a huge role for that. It's super important, like um, you know, and it's like uh, groups like informal using formal verification to like analyze and model all this stuff is like extremely important. Yeah, I, I think that security is. There, there's another thing that um, it, that, well, it's just a random random thing. But with with mesh security, if you have the ability to to slash delegators, um, you could have a consumer chain which which could go and uh, execute an attack by slashing a lot of you know, slashing a lot of delegators at once, reducing their validator stake through that, promoting their own validators on the provider chain. So that's definitely something that needs to be dealt with. We're actually doing a circuit breaker in replicated security to help prevent that. Um, but even then, you still have to stop the chain. Uh, I, I guess you could probably automate things even more to stop that attack, but it's also kind of a fuzzy sort of thing to evaluate. So we're going to keep looking for things like that and also commonalities with replicated security where we've already sort of found solutions and uh, suggesting those as, uh, as they go. And I was making comments on the, on the repo, but yeah. Cool. Anything else you guys want to talk about? You mentioned data availability. Um, so I mean, one thing that uh, we've been thinking about recently is this like mesh data availability system um, where like, I mean, hot take, I, I think this kind of modular blockchains idea is a little bit odd to me, where in the sense that I don't see in what scenarios you want data availability to be separated from settlement systems, um, especially kind of the whole point of a settlement system is you need to be able to prove data availability to it before you settle. And unless there's a way of creating efficient like pro proofs of data availability, it feels weird for these to be separated. So either you have like the Ethereum model of the world, which is like, you know, you have the, the dank sharding built into the protocol where you build, you know, Ethereum is the base settlement layer and it's the data availability layer for everything. That's one plausible view of the world. But then in a Cosmos view, when there's no single settlement layer, kind of the whole premise of Cosmos, I don't see why we would want any single data availability layer rather than every settlement layer providing data availability sampling uh, to its own IBC peers. So there'll be like, um, you know, little data, you know, Osmosis will run a data availability sampling cluster of its data and all of the nodes of its IBC peers will be participating in that while Juno will run a little data availability sampling uh, cluster of its data and all of its IBC peers will be sampling of that. So instead of having one global system, it'll be many localized systems. So can I enjoy a comment there? So one advantage of having a large data bit layer is that you can get gain from scaling through coding. So uh, verifiable information dispersal gives you a scaling gain. So that's one disadvantage of having smaller data bit a bit. Yeah, there, you know, with the way that the, like the quadratic nature of data availability sampling and like, you know, the uh, erasure encoding, yeah, there is, it does cause the data sizes to be bigger when there's like, you know, you, you compact data in like right. one larger data lake that gets like, uh, has data, data availability sampling that it, there is some efficiencies there. Um, so I think maybe there'll be like some combination of it. I think major chains will probably want to run their own data availability sampling systems while maybe some smaller 
things will like outsource it to other chain, which seems to be like the general takeaway in general, where like, you know, same thing with security, right? Some chains will want to like outsource it completely. Some chains will want to do it all internal. Some will want to do some hybrid. And I think we're going to start seeing that for like data availability as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is really far, like, and, and I'm also not an expert on, uh, on, on roll-ups. I know a little bit, but I think that the, the dream might be that you have blockchains, like, with no validators. Um, <laughs> that would be cool. Or you just have sequencers, and then they have proofs. Mm -hmm. And when you need to, like, you, when you need to evaluate whether someone's done something right, you just look at the proof and get the data from maybe several data availability layers. You don't need to really, like, trust any one given consensus set. So I actually think that this single sequencer model of rollups is actually like really harmful for the ecos for like all of crypto because rollups give you safety. They don't give you liveness or censorship and MEV resistance. So if you care about liveness or let's call it fast liveness, right? Uh, you know, there's always, okay, yeah, you can exit back to the settlement chain, but okay, that's a very slow system of liveness, right? If you want li fast liveness or, or censorship and MEV resistance, you want to have some sort of decentralized, even rollups should be running with some decentralized validator set. Well, I think maybe, like, I don't know, but I think maybe in the future someone will figure out how to have, like, um, you know, something that's a system that's, like, really tailor-made just for the anti-censorship scenario and kind of separate that out from everything else, but, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, one of the final thoughts for me is, like, I'm just really excited about this whole class, class, class of mesh protocols. Um, you know, data availability is really useful if you're trying to build something like a global name service between a couple of different chains. Like, uh, you know, one of the chains I, I work on, Stargaze, uh, you know, is building like an interchain NFT marketplace and is looking at doing things like decentralized social and stuff like that. To scale that, we might it might actually be like a whole consortium of chains. And the you know, Stargaze is launching a name service, and it'd be really great to, you know, coordinate that name service, you know, throughout that network of chains uh but and you know like this whole like the use case of like yeah a global namespace or like um you know these kinds of mesh governance protocols um really i think that we're again like during my talk i was like interchain is the new paradigm we're at the start of this new like era it's not we're not fully in the midst of it yet we're still mostly in the multi-chain world still but like we're starting to explore these different ideas around interchain security what that looks like these what are what are these interchain protocols what are these mesh protocols and i don't know i think that's it's just a really exciting time and like diversity is great like um my, i guess my last thought before i put down the microphone uh is that like ics uh, v1 still has some really great properties about it like a lot of people might not want their own validator set. Like, you know, if you're a certain type of company, maybe you don't even want to run a blockchain. And like, there's like, that's like a real like group of people that want those kind of features. And then mesh security also has great properties. And I think there's going to be many types of mesh security as well. Like um, there, there could be many different flavors. And it's just, I cannot be more excited to be at like the start of this like new, like wave of innovation around these mesh protocols. Yeah, the, the other thing is if you look at replicated security versus smart contracts, um, there are a lot of Ethereum projects that want to have their own chain, but they kind of never get around to it. Um, so, you know, like Uniswap, Compound, this Compound chain has been talked about for many years now. Um, there's a DYDX, I think, um, but, but it's like, so, so not many of them actually make the jump. Um, and with replicated security, you can sort of go halfway. You don't have to have your own validator set. You can still customize your business logic the way you want, which you can go deeper than you can with a smart contract. Uh, and then you always have the option uh, from your chain's own governance to transition out of replicated security, transition to a standalone chain maybe, or transition to mesh security when it's ready. Yeah, I think it's amazing that we went from, you know, just over a year ago, uh, IBC bouncing empty packets back and forth between two chains to now talking about blockchain NATO. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's a really profound change in our industry. And uh, thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, David, and everyone for an amazing panel. And now, the moment we've all been here for.
food is ready. So we're going to take 20 minute break and we're going to come back, recharge our batteries. Um, and then we'll, we have two more exciting panels. We have sushi outside. I'm excited. That's what I signed up for. <laughs>